Welcome back to the podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in. Today's episode is about a few different things, uh, things I didn't think I was going to touch on. But yeah, it was an interesting episode. Let me know what you think in the comment section and we'll see you all next week. Peace. Today we've got a very special guest in the house, Aviva. Uh, thanks for joining me. What, what does your name mean? Spring. Sp- man, that's so cool. I, I so thought- not as in bouncy, bouncy, but as in... <laughs> <laughs> Springtime. <laughs> cool. Um, nice. I, I love that. I love the mm. fact that because like when uh, there's that insurance company called Aviva yeah. and that probably gives you a bad name, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Um, when we spoke first, I had like a billion questions for you. Just for everyone else who's watching and listening, what do you do uh, for work? I'm a yoga teacher. I also teach children with special needs to read and write at um, my local school. I don't know if I told you that, actually. I don't think you did. No. That's very cool. And then I have another business with whole food nutrition products, which ties in very well with my yoga teaching. Mm. Um, yeah, I, I liked... When we spoke, I, this is what I wanted this episode to be about. When we spoke... I got so inspired by because I've seen so much dysfunctional parenting like it it's I'm not gonna just burden us with the negativity right now but I've seen so much of it and when I heard like oh my daughter wants to do this told her go and do it you know oh you want to you want to earn money to go and do that thing yeah you work at the pub or you work with somewhere nearby and you go and make your dreams work Mm. we need more of that so like I just wanted to ask some questions about like where this has all come from like how, what, what age did you have your children? I was 28 when I had my eldest and the younger one three years later. Mm-hmm. And what, like, did you plan on having them at that age? Um, yeah, pretty much. Um, it was a relationship that was quite an early relationship for mm. me. Within the year I was pregnant, but, you know, it was intentional. Wow, that's yeah. amazing. How so? Like, here's one of the things that I always think about. Like, how do you know? Hey, I'm. I would actually have a child with this person. I think really that if everyone waited until they were hundred percent ready to have children, no one would ever have children. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There literally isn't a perfect time. You can always put it off. Um, but. You know, with hindsight, I know it was the right time for me. I'm not quite sure how you know, but I don't think... I really don't think there's that perfect time. Mm, out of everyone I've asked, they, ne- they never said... Like, most people say, like, I wish I didn't at that age and stuff like that. But you know, I could have made excuses that I had a really good career at the time. And, you know, in terms of that, it wasn't great timing. But, you know, you work around things. Mm. So do you feel like you've had to compromise like your dreams or your goals or anything since having children? Um, well, with the eldest, I didn't give up work. I used to be um, working for a music publishing company doing royalties and I didn't give up work straight away. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I did have a really good career there. I was very young in for what I was doing. Mm. You know, I think... Um, when I became royalties manager, I think I was the youngest in the UK. But it was having my second child, and that's when I stopped working for that company, but it was really looking at the older one and thinking, oh my goodness, she's three years old, how did that happen? You know, I've missed so much of what she's been doing, and this isn't right for me at all. Mm. So I guess some people would say I compromised my career then, but I was, you know, very happy to stop and look after my children at home hmm that's that's really interesting because some i've heard like i'm going to keep doing this by the way i'm going to keep comparing the really nice positive stuff to the, the nonsense i heard some people say like resent their children because like oh it's because of you i couldn't travel and this and that and i'm thinking to myself like how are you going to blame someone who didn't have a say in mm. what was going on do you know what i'm saying like yeah, i think that's absolutely. i think that's a scapegoat for you like it's a, it's a convenient excuse to say oh i blame this external factor because i didn't take the action required mm. and i think this is something i love to encourage especially people around my age group to think about like you don't have to cram everything in to this short period of life called your 20s is that your whole life is is ahead of you but there's a there's a very toxic culture of like I'm going to travel, I'm going to career stuff, I'm going to do all of these things in this short period of time. And then after that, 
that's it. Yeah, I mean, I just think it's different. Everyone is developing all the time. Everyone mm. is changing all the time. When I look at what I do now and, you know, the fact that I really love helping people, you know, in general with their house, and then I look back at my career then, which I was very, very happy with, I don't want that career anymore. Mm. So, you know, you could equally see it as a positive when you, you know, suddenly make that change, let one thing go. I think you have to make room for the new stuff by, um, yeah, make room for the new, by getting rid of the old stuff. Mm. Like, if if that's a job situation or relationship and stuff like that, it's really, um, there's a lot of, like, that's why I love meditation, because it teaches you detachment, right? Mm. Like, you just, all right, let it go. Let's see what's coming next. Oh, Mm. that's coming. Oh, that's cool. Okay, that's gone now. And I think, like, those practices... It help you with practical stuff like okay this this situation is not serving me let's allow that to move on and see what comes in by you inviting it rather than resisting it like oh no change is coming and it's bad that's that's a very like toxic way to live and i was doing that for a long time do you do you think that having children has made you has what well, okay rephrase the question what kind of changes do you think you've seen in your own personality since having children that's a hard one. I mean, I, you know, I am a very, very different person to the person I was, you know, 20, nearly 23 years ago when I had the eldest, but that wouldn't be just because of having children. Mm. You know, I feel I'm a very, very different person since I took up yoga seriously, you know, certainly since I did my yoga teacher training. So, yeah, I think it's just, as I said, people are slowly developing with everything they do. Um, you know, and you certainly don't have to stop doing things like travelling. Mm. We've done so much travelling with our children. That's so amazing. Mm. Where, where, so when did you start travelling with your kids? Oh, immediately. What? Like you don't Serious? have to stop at all. Whoa. That's, that's, a good, that's a reality check for everyone. <laughs> I mean, it's hard. Yeah. In fact, I was speaking to a friend of mine today who took her sister's four-year-old on a plane journey. But she doesn't have her own children. And she was saying, oh, gosh, now I really understand what parents go through doing those, you know, plane journeys. Mm-hmm. But, you know, it's certainly not a reason to stop traveling. We've taken them all over the place. Mm, that's so cool, man. Like, this is why, look, I feel like this, this mentality of, like, it's not the end of the world. It's actually the beginning of a new journey when you have children. Mm. That's what we need to be talking about when it comes to this, these ideas of, like, settling down I don't understand why is it called settling down (laughs) like you know this is what happens in my brain when someone says settling down you know when you go to the beach and you step in into the 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 water right underneath you can see all the sand has come up and it's like floating about and then it starts to settle down like surely that means the excitement is gone like the the sand's not excited anymore so you almost equate it to someone settling there like yeah. literally settling to the bottom of the seabed and being like oh, i'm here now everything's done yeah and i think that's because the conditioning i was brought up with to believe like yeah once you've married and had children your job's basically done mm. and, and being people like yourself this is why i got so like you know last time i met you i was so excited because i'm meeting people in your age group before they were all telling me yeah I've got this condition and that and I can't really do much and oh yeah if I was your age I'd do those things but we're not like that and you're here on Shaper with your smartphone teaching yoga encouraging your children to p- pursue their dreams I'm thinking to myself what what's what's happened here like do, have you always thought like this or was See, I think that's quite funny because it was so lovely to meet you and so refreshing and you were so positive and yet I didn't think I was doing anything unusual <laughs> <laughs> that's I was, why I was a bit blown away like oh this guy's being really really nice yeah I me. think it's that story uh, they say there's a story behind every person right mm. and yeah it's my frame of reference for old older people than me is not very good from the past but now like moving into this way of life every person i meet who's older than me or the same age or whatever is like they're on they, it reflects what belief system i'm paying more attention into you know yeah, because you're in such a different position mm. with your life it's, it's definitely true everyone grows and evolves at their own different mm. rates and that um that you're attracting people that resonate with you yeah definitely and it's like that's that's why i want to do more of this because it's it feels good to mm. know that like we're doing something we both uh, are interested in 
we're both aligned on similar beliefs and stuff. What got you into the yoga teaching? That was actually... So I'm not saying it was easy having young kids at home mm. because it's not, you know, it really isn't. And when I had my second one and I was at home, stopped working, you know, so with the two kids at home, I had two different friends that said to me, Aviva, I don't know how you're doing this with two young children at home. They also had two young children each mm. at home and yoga was their sort of release each week to head off to their yoga class that's when I really started I'd been previously to yoga when I was pregnant mm. but I didn't really take to that and then I went to yoga after I had my first child and you took the baby as well and you you know it's all supposed to be calm and lovely but Roxy just cried all the time and I kept <laughs> having to sit sit down against a wall and feed her mm. but you know sort of taking yoga more seriously was when I had the two of them at home and friends really encouraging me to you know to find a little bit of sanity <laughs> <laughs> when you say sanity like you're referring to like peace and quiet peace and quiet yeah 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 and making sure that even as a mum you still have that little bit of time on your own even if it is once or twice a week mm. I think that's essential for everyone. Mm. But I, I can't imagine what it's like with children. I know what it's like with dogs, but that's not a, a comparison. Like, <laughs> no. they don't talk. And it did take me a long time to really understand it. Mm. Some people, it's quite instant with them, with yoga, you know, two, three weeks in, and they really understood. But it wasn't really like that with me. To really find those moments of stillness within a yoga class took me some time. Mm. And then many, many years later, when I was coming up to the time of thinking, gosh, my, I've got two teenagers, I am coming to the point where they're going to leave home, mm. what do I do now? And I was looking at different options, you know, maybe doing more of a teaching qualification so that I could teach more hours at the school where I worked, thinking about mm, the teacher training for yoga, and it just really was coincidence that the lady who, whose classes I attended mostly was running a yoga teacher training starting a few months after I started thinking about what I was going to do with my time. Mm. So when you, when, you started te when you started the training program with your teacher, like how is it different to when you just take a class? Well, it was a two year course, so a long course. So, you know, there was a lot of learning, you know, mm. lots about the philosophy and, you know, um, really sort of picking apart the postures, what benefits they had to your body, what benefits they had for your mind. So, you know, very different to just attending mm. a yoga class. Awesome. That's, that's, see, this is, I, again, I was just saying to you before we started recording, I keep taking on more things. And you know, before I met you, I was thinking like, oh, maybe I should do the yoga teacher thing. Like, I think there's like a 200 hour thing. Yeah. Um, I was like, just might as well do it. And then I thought to myself, I don't even have time to do this. Like, what the <laughs> hell are you thinking? Um, how do you think yoga's, how do you think yoga's benefited you over the years? I think it's allowed me to find stillness. Um, I think learning how to breathe correctly can help you in so many, many ways. You know, certainly with stress, mm. with, you know, very busy periods of time, even being on a flight where, you know, it's all a bit crazy and it's noisy and, you know, you've got hours and hours left. Um, obviously, in keeping my body strong. Mm. Yeah. I think that's so important. Like, to see you in, in good health is an understatement but like you're in good health uh, good shape at your age like I think that okay for everyone else who doesn't know like could you could you give us like a, a ballpark of what age group you're in because I, I apparently it's rude to ask people their age I didn't know that okay I don't really think it's rude I'm 51 okay cool well, I'm glad you don't think it's rude because people in the past have told me it's very rude yeah it is kind of a generational thing as well my mum used to always tell us it was rude to ask someone their age <laughs> that's so weird um, but yeah, I think like, okay, you're 51, like some people have told me like life's over at 50. What do I do now? I'm just thinking to myself, like you got a functioning body, like it's, it's, it's here, like you're living in this thing. You can take care of it and it can serve you. Like you can still do stuff. 
Mm. Like, what's your advice for people in their, like, late 40s or 50s that are making those excuses about, like, oh, I'm not really doing much? Well, I'm not sure where you find these people. <laughs> but and You don't want to know either. <laughs> good nutrition and keeping your body moving. Mm. You know, absolutely. You know, you don't have another body to live in. You've got to look after it. I know that's a real cliche, but you really, really do. Nothing else is going to function properly in your life. You've got to keep your body healthy. I want to come back to the breathing correctly. Mm. This is this is something that's changed my whole life. Like, you know when you get moments of complete presence, where you realise, like, maybe it's like a couple of times in the day that you, you're not thinking and you're completely there. For me, taking a massive like breath through my nose and holding onto it and then breathing out of my mouth and like holding empty, that has like made me appreciate those moments of presence so much more. And I start giving myself more moments of presence by doing that actively. Like, you're gonna laugh, but I used to have really bad road rage. Like I would be that the stupid young man in the car trying to drive fast and rolling the window down, shouting like, "Oh, move out the way!" and like swearing at people if they get arguments and this nonsense. See, I can't imagine that of you. Yeah, you, you don't want to trust me. It was not a good time. <laughs> but I, yeah, I knew where it was coming from. There's a lot of like stuff to, that has healed since then, and I no longer do that. But the massive part of like reducing those tendencies in the beginning was just breathing. And taking that breath to be like, you're not going to be like, so what someone cut in front of you, you're going to be 0.5 seconds later home than mm. you probably would before. So what's the actual problem here? And taking that breath has helped me to appreciate small things like that. So do you think that anger was a lot to do with your upbringing? Oh no, I knew exactly, I knew exactly where the anger was coming from. So I'm actually going to touch on this later in a video coming soon. I don't know when I'm going to make it, but I need to tell my depression story. Um, like I don't, I do this because I don't believe in label, like I don't understand what this depression thing is. It, I think it's different for everyone, but there's overlaps. Mm -hmm. But um, I have, I, yeah, I've had a lot of resentment towards myself and others. And I used to make excuses for it, and then I used to allow that resentment to just come out randomly. Um, the, the analogy I use is like, let's say you get a bottle of Coke, and you put mints in there, right? And you shake it up. Now, obviously the thing wants to explode, but I never allowed that, that to be expressed for a long period of time. And instead of it exploding all at once or being released periodically, just it would break open sometimes and like randomly out of the blue I might have an argument with someone or something like that so I was I was not allowing that energy to be expressed and it was causing havoc like I was just playing PlayStation smoking weed drinking alcohol and not really talking to many many people um, unless it was my friends at the time who weren't really friends and just like let's get drunk and forget about our problems mm. so I, I know like a lot of my previous anger it wasn't I can't even call it anger it's just like not being conscious about myself that was a lot of that was coming from my inability to address what had happened in the past and over, like I'll just cut a long story short I'll go into it in more detail on the channel but like over the course of about five years I was in a very toxic situation with someone I didn't want to be in a relationship with but there was like their dad was a police officer and she knew that she could use me for things like money having a place to stay her parental home was really like awful so she was trying to get stay out of the house as much as possible and after I said I didn't really want to be with this person the blackmail started so she was like right if you don't do exactly as I say I'm gonna tell my dad and I was like alright I called her bluff on it first and I was like okay cool then I got a phone call from my dad and he was like if you touch my door this and that and I just got scared so much of the resentment like I allowed, I allowed this situation to go on for almost five years and it developed from like I'm gonna use you to uh, she was trying to make me kill myself because I put the idea in her head I was like oh, I'm not really happy with my life and this kind of stuff and she basically took that ran with the idea and tried lots of things like lots and um i'm kind of fortunate like i i can admit like for for those four or five years i was intentionally trying to kill myself with alcohol pretty much on a daily and weekly basis and uh much of that was like i hated myself for not getting out of that situation i used to call myself a bitch and be like oh you're not doing you know how can you even yeah a lot of stuff like that 
and uh, at that time, like one one of the main games that this person was playing was like trying to get other people to laugh at me to show me that like no one actually likes you, so you might as well just kill yourself. So there was a lot of that that I just blamed myself for. So do you mean someone you were seeing as a girlfriend? In the beginning, it just started out as very casual, like. I don't even know what to call it, like dating mm. kind of, but um, it was definitely like after a couple of weeks in, I realized like they told me, this person told me like I like to play mind games, I like to turn friends against each other, I like to see people fighting over me and stuff like that. I was like, whoa, I don't want to have anything to do with that, and that's when the blackmail started because, well, yeah, apparently that's what people do and they don't want to let go. You didn't get out at that first stage where you knew. I was 18 years old. That was my first relationship experience and um, yeah man I'd, I was just like oh well there's nothing I can do about it mm. so it was again like, it was a convenient excuse like oh here's the circumstance and here's why I can't take action to get out of it so you know I used to chalk it up to stupid reasons like oh God doesn't like me what? <laughs> that doesn't even make any sense and like, then you started numbing yourself basically yeah I, uh, the main things was like, I liked cannabis before that point anyway but when that point hit I really turned to it as like the any excuse. I'm brushing my teeth, okay, let's smoke. I'm gonna go out to dinner, let's smoke. I'm gonna talk to my friend, I'm gonna go to the library, any excuse. And then the alcohol thing, I was ne- I've never really been a big drinker my whole life, but this period of time, I, I know like the way I was using it, it wasn't like it was fun. I was using it as an escape to s- forget about things. And it worked, it does a great way of working, but so part of this story is I went to Australia for a year with this person and uh, that's when it's that's when shit started to get real like they she tried to so in that period of time there was a lot of like dysfunctional sexual behavior that she was exhibiting and it wasn't anything to do with me so she would put date rape drugs in my drink and then get groups of guys to like help her take me back to the room and they would have sex on top of my unconscious body and then I would remember bits and pieces of it the next day and then she would laugh at me about it and show me the pictures and the videos and stuff and then she and then straight away be like oh I don't know what you're talking about but laughing all the time so when when I stopped drinking alcohol these memories started coming back to me like all of those like times that I got drugged they started coming back to me I was like did that really happen and then the the memories got so detailed I was like yeah I actually remember that now I remember that person laughing I mean I remember that person saying this the next day and the weird thing is like I don't understand that kind of behavior like I still to this day I still I used to judge and be like oh you're this and that I don't I don't have time to judge anymore so I don't but like I don't understand what you get out of that behavior because like it doesn't make sense to me. And, and a lot of people I've spoken with, it That's doesn't make sense. That's truly awful. No wonder you were holding on to so much anger. Oh, but it was all to myself, man. Like, it, I was angry with myself for letting it happen. I used to just be really negative to everyone because I didn't like myself. And how old were you when you went to Australia? <laughs> I was 20. So, well, like... you know, really, what you've done in the change that you've made is incredible. <laughs> I appreciate it. Thank no, you. It really, really is. Yeah. Yeah, this this is, uh, but look, the, I see it as cycles repeat themselves. So when I was young, when I was between the ages of five and nine, a lot of like a lot of dysfunctional shit was happening, and I knew I should have called Childline. Again, I was being a bitch. I saw it come up on TV. I was like, I started crying, and I was like, oh, I can't do it. I can't do it. I don't, and I used the phone. I used the excuse. I don't know how the phone works. What? I was like seven. Of course, I know how the phone works. See, my mom do it a thousand times, but kept making excuses and I have I have experienced it firsthand the stuff that was happening when I was a kid it was out of my control so I believe soul contracts right like you come here you contracted to have the experiences with your daughters and your husband before you came here that's a soul contract right you didn't really have control over who your children were going to be I believe the same thing for family members uh, things that are outside of your control and you contract to have them before you come here so that was the first one in the beginning and I didn't learn the lesson I was supposed to learn and I kept pushing it to the back of my head until I completely forgot about it. Then when I was 18, the cycle starts to repeat itself again, but in a different way because obviously you're a different person. And I have a feeling it was going to be a third cycle until I stopped drinking and that was my saviour. And So really the initial issues you had were with your dad? No, not necessarily. My dad's cool, like... I think he wasn't around a lot when we were younger. He started his own business. He was working with uh, his, his family business and stuff. 
my main I have a lot of I had a lot of resentment issues with my parents as well because I used to say to them like how can you allow people to just impose belief systems on you such as you know you're, you're not allowed to do certain things you, we, we pick who you're supposed to love and stuff like that but then I, I checked myself I was like well if I was their age when I got when when they got married if I got married at their age when they did very young and there was a whole part of this whole traditional culture and stuff hey man you're just doing what you were told was right so let's not judge my main issue was like I I hated my culture and I, I made this stupid statement and saying like I'm never going to talk to Indian people again and like all Indian people are crazy and messed up I don't think that's true but there's systemic issues in our community which I address very regularly and I talk about this pedophilia in our community I don't get down with it there's child molesting in our community. I'm not getting down with it. There's there's rape. There's there's like stupidity. And when I say stupidity, it's not like I'm judging people for their beliefs. I'm talking about you're encouraging men to see themselves as real men if they drink a certain amount of alcohol. To me, that's stupidity. I don't know about anyone else. But I, I feel like I've been blessed with these experiences. Yeah, they were very challenging. A lot of them I perceived in lots of negative ways, but I was blessed with them because I'm able to handle it and cr create something out of the other side of it that other people need. Since I started doing all of this, people in the village that I come from, well, I can't say I come from, like my family comes from, they've said to me like, hey man, we never questioned this before. That's right, we shouldn't be doing this stuff. Why is this in our culture? Like, shouldn't we get rid of that? I feel so like, that was scary. I, I feel like so energized when I know like I'm actually starting the conversation or like having this these types of conversations because it gets swept under the rug. Indian people are very secretive. A lot of the outside world sees, a, oh, the colorful weddings and they had an elephant. Oh, this food's amazing. You don't see the, the behind the scenes. Like people hate each other and, and they're still pretending that they like each other and stuff like that. So when I, when I try and pinpoint where my, where my issues were, I just, it's, a lot of it is cultural. A lot of it. It's, this became about me mm -hmm. very quickly, didn't it? <laughs> 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 yeah, that's, it's interesting. I don't really get to talk about myself that much. No, it's amazing. It's good. There's, there's a lot of things that I think are important for us to talk about. Um, but yeah, th those are some of the things like they've, those experiences have helped shape me into who I am today. But it didn't, it didn't happen like overnight. Mm. It, it wasn't like, a, yeah, I'm just going to suddenly change and be really positive. It's, it takes like, it's incremental change, but then it becomes exponential like in a period of time. The last three years, I've changed dramatically. I'm not the same person I was three weeks ago, let alone three years ago. So what do you think the catalyst was for all of that? I'm going to partly shout out my brother. Yeah, my brother introduced me to a few YouTube channels and a few books and stuff, and I just took the information and ran with it. And uh, yeah, it just felt so true when I came across it. Lots of different things. How about you? And instead of talking about me so much, what <laughs> what uh, significant or not significant? What what challenges have you overcome, and what what do you think they've added to your journey? Um, mm, challenges that I've overcome. Well, there's the fact that I was a migraine sufferer for thirty five years. Started when I was hit my teens and you know really really in quite a major way and then about four and a half years ago I was diagnosed with chronic daily migraine so it was just as likely that I would wake up in the morning and have a migraine than wouldn't have a migraine and that's something that I really have changed through learning about nutrition and it's had such a major impact on me really realizing how much people could change so many different illnesses by looking at what they put inside their bodies. Mm. So, you know, that's really one of the major things for me. I'm now two and a half years migraine free. Yeah, I haven't had one at all, which, you know, I just find incredible. My doctor finds incredible. He's just so blown away by it. And um, I don't know, challenges, you know, being brought up on one of the roughest housing estates in the UK. Um, from the age of nine to 20. Um, you know, you're talking about your family. You know, there's, my dad left when I was one years old. 
So, you know, my mum was single parent, bringing up three daughters on her own. But, you know, although that's seen very typically as a negative, I know people whose parents stayed together and they actually, those people had much harder time than if their parents work together. Mm. You know, if the, if the relationship isn't healthy, then, you know, it can actually be a much more stressful environment at home. 100%. Mm, than the fact that my dad wasn't around, you know. I think that's so true, man. There's, mm. there's people who are like, oh, I'm holding it together for the kids. Kids are not stupid. Mm. Like, I know... It, oh, some people are like... They, they treat children like they're not... I don't know what the word is. Not second-class citizens. It's like... As if they're just, like, they're not people. As if they're, like, animals that can't talk. Like, oh, you know, this has happened. Like, people, people have said, like, oh, I don't want to get divorced because it looks bad. Uh, that comes from my community, which is another highlight of, of, mm. the, of the conversation. <laughs> but there's a lot of people that are doing that. Like, um, I don't want to get divorced because it's going to ruin my family home. And it's like, well, what good are you doing right now? Um, speaking about marriage and stuff, how long have you been married for? I have been married for um, nearly, no, it's 11 years now, but together with my now husband for 23 years. Whoa. Mm. So you weren't married in the beginning? No. What made you decide to get married? Oh, that's a tricky one. Kind of, you know, it was just, you know, gosh, it was just so awkward at school all the time me having a different surname to him and people found that really confusing and the kids, you know, even in terms of travel, it's like, okay, there's this name on the passport and, you know, I guess we buckled under <laughs> sort of pressure of what people usually do, mm. you know. Yeah. That's very interesting because mm. someone asked me, like, will you ever get married? And I was like, don't really see the point in it mm. it's a piece of paper yeah does, does that does that define that i love someone mm. no but also in terms of what would happen if one of us died you know tax wise and everything mm. you know we had our you know finance guy saying it really would be a lot easier <laughs> if you guys got married it's very very unromantic yeah it's true true but yeah. but i think the real romance is to be found in like how do you interact with your partner daily Mm. Not we had this one day where we spent X amount of money mm. and and everyone had a good time. Mm. I'm sure they did, but how does your daily life with your partner look? I think that's way more important to mm. consider. On that topic, late I don't know about lately, but I've been hearing uh, lots of different things about uh, relationships becoming open, and I don't understand it to be honest. Um, my brain is. I don't have a lot of space for things because I'm constantly doing stuff. I think I only have room in my life for one woman at a time, as in one relationship, romantic relationship. I don't, I don't think I could open it up to any more than that. No, I couldn't. But what you, what's your... Yeah, I mean, you know, each to their own, honestly. If both, you know, sides of the partnership are happy with it, fine, go mm. for it. But, yeah, it's not something for me. Yeah, I think the polyamory thing is, is kind of like... When I say kind of crazy, I don't mean as in like you're mad for believing in it. I just think it like for me, it's a crazy concept. Like there's so many people, like three people is a lot. And I've seen some people tell me like, oh, I'm in a polyamorous relationship with nine people. I'm like, what? How, how do you remember their names? How do you remember <laughs> what they like? How do you remember what food they like? Just, just, all these things come up for me. Like I wouldn't be able to remember and I'd feel really bad. Like, hey, Sandra, my name's Susan. I'm like, oh, shit, that's my bad. You know, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to do it. But why do you think it's becoming more common, like now? Honestly, I do not know. Um, I haven't thought about this at all. Hmm. I mean, is it more common? I, I believe it is, because before I never really was hearing about this. But then, at the same time, I was wasn't really interacting with these kinds of people. So. I don't think it's a coincidence that I'm finding out about it now either. Mm. I think mainly this, like the internet, like, you know, 20 years ago, me and you having this conversation, no one else would hear it. Yeah. I mean, maybe it isn't actually more prevalent, but yeah, you're just hearing about it more. I, I, think, actually, I don't know. I think this is the case with a lot of things. Like, mm. you know, um, particularly with things that go on in, in America in secret. I think this has always been happening. 
You know, there's always been problems in in all areas of society, but now that everyone's walking around with this, mm. you can you can find out about stuff that's happening in Louisiana right now that you would never have known about. Mm. Um, cooking as well, like you find out a lot of cool recipes that come from there. <laughs> so we've we've had um, we've talked about a lot of things that I didn't think we were going to get into, which was interesting. Um, what what do you what do you want from the rest of the time that you've got here? And doesn't you know, no one knows how long that's going to be here on this planet? You mean? Well, I, I wasn't referring to the recording. <laughs> oh, <laughs> gosh. I like to make jokes. <laughs> yeah, I, I I like to ask the question, not like that you should have it all figured out, but just like you, you're here for X amount of time. What do you want to do? What do you want to be? Do you have C experience? That kind of stuff. Hmm. I want to travel more, lots more. I want to, you know, continue finding those moments of peace, of calmness. I think it's really, really super important. There's nothing more important to me than seeing my girls happy. Mm. Yeah. And helping more people find yoga, start their yoga journey. Mm. That's probably a good place to pick up on as well. What advice do you give to the people who say, Yoga? Oh, not flexible enough for that. That it only takes flexibility of the mind. That mm. is all. Everybody can do yoga. I think I mentioned to you a recent yogi who was told that they were bad at yoga. There isn't such a thing. Anybody can do yoga. If someone comes to my class and they do two postures and then think, oh, I feel really tired now, and they want to lie on their mat and breathe and pick up the energy from the room, they are doing yoga. Mm. So, you know, I'd say just try it. And there's so many different forms of yoga. You know, it frustrates me a bit if someone has tried a class and they say, oh, I don't like yoga, and they literally have tried a yoga class. There are yoga teachers whose classes I don't enjoy going to. You just have to try mm. and find that person that really resonates with you. I think that's true for a lot of things. Like I think with coaching, with meditation teachers, with yoga teachers, there's there's a variety of approaches and styles out there for all of these things. Mm. It's like uh, you know, if you're learning how to drive a car, I'm sure there's lots of different techniques. The guy that I first learned with was uh, was not very good, but let's not get into that. The last guy that I learned with was great because no, you're right. Even that's really different. Mm. Or sometimes it won't. It's not even that they haven't found their right teacher. It's that. It takes a while, you know, as I was saying to you, I didn't really get what I was doing at yoga at first, and it just takes a while mm. for some people. Yeah, and you've got to be patient. Like, mm. it, you can't develop a, a solid meditation practice where you never interrupt yourself and never itch or anything. I Not have, I have, at all. I have hairy legs, so like, I just, <laughs> sometimes I might brush a, a hair and be like, ooh, that's taking my attention away. But it takes time, like, you're cultivating a plant. It's not going to suddenly sprout because went to one class. That's like you watered the plant once and you're expecting the seed to sprout into a tree. And all meditation is, is the fact that you've become aware of the fact you've just interrupted what you were doing and accepting it and drawing your mind back. Hmm. That's all. Everyone has got a super, super busy mind. I'd, I would like to start doing... Um, meditation for busy people mm. and just like just because it's such a everyone's busy and yeah. regardless if you're doing a lot or nothing like mm. your mind is doing stuff and i think yeah it's, it's a funny concept because like everyone's busy mm. we might as well start start acknowledging Absolutely. it's not Which an excuse is why i was quite interested in having you come along and do some meditation with my yogis yeah, yeah, I'm looking forward to that. It's going to be a lot of fun. Mm. I, lo I love the, um, the, the, the challenge aspect of it. Not that I'm challenging you, you've got to do 30 minutes straight. And no, but just like everyone who tries it, including the person who's teaching, is having some sort of challenge at that point uh, in, in rest, le letting the mind rest, letting certain ideas of outcome rest. Like really uh, in coaching, they say, you know, let's park that for a second and let's have a look at this instead and I think that I love seeing the what happens in someone's mind when they come out of the meditation they're like wow mm. or if they came out the outside like I couldn't do it but I had this one bit where I was yeah seconds yeah yeah I think like a great meditation practice is made up of those seconds of real presence it's, mm. it's amazing 
And it is just gently drawing your mind back all the time. Hmm. There's not. I think when I started, I, I have. I'm a very like all or nothing person. I was like, right, one hour every day, five till six in the morning. I'm gonna be great. Like three minutes in, I was like, this is torture. I can't do it. <laughs> I used to check my phone thinking, how long has it been now? Can I, can I finish? And it was, oh, it was a nightmare. Uh, I'm definitely not doing that again. <laughs> so, um, so people can have a little timer on their phone so I, that they're not kind of wondering, you know, if they've set aside five minutes to meditate and they have got no idea when that five minutes is up. Just put a little timer hmm. off on a clock. Radical idea. <laughs> have a little alarm on there what, what's your opinion on like you you've seen the world pre-internet right mm. a lot of people nowadays especially they don't remember what it was like to have no smartphones no like none of this like what what do you think has been the like the most significant change with this technology that you've seen I think the most significant change is for youngsters to struggle through their time at school. Mm. I think that's incredibly sad, I really do. That, you know, kids might have had difficulties at school, but they'd go home and they'd have that release from it. it they wouldn't be bombarded with things and there are so many kids that are bullied online, so many, mm. and it has such a major impact and I think that's terribly sad. Mm. And, you know, parents are struggling to actually encourage their kids. There are very, very few teenagers that will give their phones to their parents in the evening so that they don't have to deal with that, Mm. you know. I just think it's really, really sad and people are very, very much attached to their phone. I would like everything to be reversed. Do you think it ever will be? No. I'm not sure, man. I'm I'm really not sure because I met a 14-year-old the other day that says, I was on my phone, I was checking an email, and she just checked me on it. She was like, oh, you're missing out on real life because you're in your phone. I was like, huh? <laughs> what, what What did you just say? Which is amazing. And I was brilliant. like, wow. How? It's a rarity, it really is. Very rare, but yeah. you know, that, that I think is, um, I think that's coming a lot more common, to be honest, because younger generations, they might not know the world pre-internet, but I think like, there, there's something in that like being brought up with these devices but also having an appreciation for real real world it's very rare very but I'm I'm glad I, I saw it at least a few times I saw a 10 year old telling me I, I watch your live streams and stuff on Instagram that's huge like mm. for a 10 year old I, I would, wouldn't recommend it but like because I have profanity sometimes is an issue for me but I think that's amazing like when I was 10 I was just looking at Transformers I don't really care about anything else. But there's people like going through real hard times that can use these things and that's great. But I do see us coming away from these devices. The more um, emphasis that gets placed on mental health in the workplace especially, um, well-being, distancing ourselves from disease. Like, you know, um, oh man, someone told me this story. Like they used to work in a tech company and they would see um, this, this, uh, this, bus uh, not but this van would come to the workplace and it would be like a special masseuse would come and he would work on the people's backs because the chairs had like moved the alignment of their spines and that's because you're hunched over at desk doing this all day yeah. like we're coming into the age where we know that that's not healthy anymore and that gives me hope yeah there is hope but i think you know for teenagers that's very very hard for most teenagers to see and if they start breaking away from it, they're likely to be older, you know. And it's almost like one thing that's they're focused on in their mind. You know, watching a TV program, that's almost not enough anymore. Mm. You know, you see teenagers all over the place, you know, and they're, the film's on, but they're still on their phone. Oh or, you know, you're going out, you're seeing something really amazing. But to them, it's not quite so amazing unless they take a picture of it. You gotta have proof. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. It's funny because when you say that, like, it just brought me back to this time. I was playing video games and I was, uh, I was watching the TV and I was listening to a podcast and I was like half talking to someone else and mm. I was trying to eat something at the same mm. time. And I think you're right. The, 
it's like there's not enough stimulation. Yeah. But that's why a lot of us have trouble sleeping. The mind is like, it's constantly being jolted. Mm. And if you don't give it a rest, like that electrical activity has got to subside by itself. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so I think it's a huge shame. I really do. Mm. I mean, I use it. I'm there. But mm. yeah, if I could reverse things, I would. I think this teaching us an important lesson balance right like mm. you're me and you have connected because of the internet absolutely and we only live around the corner from each other which is crazy <laughs> yeah. but like yeah we balance is, is always me be, being young as well like having this all or nothing attitude i realize it's not healthy it's not healthy all the time you need balance and and with with technology i think there's so much good that can come from it but it it's responsibility. I, I look at like psychedelics and these tools and stuff. They're all tools, right? Like they're here to be used. It doesn't mean that you're a terrible person because you used your laptop today or your phone. No, of but course not. what it means is like, if I gave you a power draw right now, Aviva, and said, hey, you go have fun. Would you, would you pick it up and be like, yeah, I've got a power drill. Let's, let's drill some stuff. No, you, and, and you wouldn't even, you haven't even read the manual. You're like, wow, okay, cool. It's a powerful tool. We've got to read the manual, use it with, uh, treat it with reverence and say, wow, it's a power drill. Like, I could probably hurt myself or someone else if I don't use it effectively uh, with, with the right knowledge and understand the risks of using it. I think that hasn't been addressed a lot in, in our culture nowadays, uh, knowing that this, this device can actually cause severe mental health challenges mm, like, and now that people really are realising that I think people need a lot more help through their schooling so you know really teachers pointing out to them how much difficulty they can have by using their phones all the time mm. Mm. I think there's also um, I use the term bridging the gap so like teachers are like older students are very young if teachers had a little bit of an insight into what was like trending with young people, I'm not saying sit down and watch hours of stupidity on, on, on YouTube. I'm definitely not going to do it. But having like for parents, especially this, 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 uh, I, I can't believe I'm about to say this, but there's this ridiculous challenge that I heard about on the internet one day. Um, people were downing a bottle of vodka in, in, in a certain amount of time. And I just thought to myself, like, this this can't be happening but parents at the time some of them knew about it and they were like i'm keeping an eye on the alcohol shelf because like i might have it in the house but i'm making sure my daughter or son isn't stupid enough to try that challenge mm. and i'm not saying like you know everyone keep up to date with the latest stuff but some of it some sometimes we need to be vigilant you know you need to keep an eye on what people are filling their minds with but unfortunately I, I can't believe I had to say that out loud like that just shows where we're at sometimes there's another one called loud challenge uh, it's about yeah smoking weed in public places and seeing if you don't get caught what what, what? all right let's 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 not get into that <laughs> that's a story for another day um it's been great speaking with you i'm i'm so glad we did this um, yeah and you thank you we did it we i want to get into a few other things about you mostly next time because i just feel like i talked about myself too much <laughs> um if anyone's got questions about yoga or health lifestyle stuff getting rid of migraines mm. where's the best place for them to contact you um, well, I'm happy for them to contact you. I'm happy, happy for people to have my number or my website. Mm -hmm. So um, my business is Aviva Sano Yoga. So, yeah. Okay, I'll put all of the links in the description section of the video. Um, yeah, if you've got questions for Aviva or myself, hit me up. All the links are in the description. And we'll see you all next time. Thanks for joining us. Peace. <laughs>